Yeah, we're going to talk about a couple of things that uh, are relevant to what uh, Dr. Geem had mentioned. Um, now all I have to do is push the right button and see. Okay, da 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 da. da, 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 da. Okay. Um, uh, the context of what I want to talk about is uh, immediate context, not the to just uh, more recent. As I think everybody knows, the uh, 2015, the text of number six in the fundamental beliefs of Adventism uh, was changed, so they added the word recent six-day creation um, to the uh, number six. You notice how the, how the number always increases? Uh, fundamental beliefs never decrease. They always increase. There's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting phenomenon there. We started with what? Three? Two? Four? Anyway. Um, and, uh, and my question on, uh, you might want to bring it up, is um, you notice that they distinguish between the universe and the creation of um, Earth or not. So the one question is, I was always wondered, uh, conventional Adventism does not argue for young earth creationism, but it does ex it accepts young life creationism. And I think that's, that's right, isn't it? I hope. Um, so the earth is very old, billions of years, but according to s standard Adventist thinking, uh, <coughs> life is very, from a geological point of view, it's very recent. Uh, so I, it came, uh, I, had, I had a question, so what, what does recent mean? I, I don't mean here, the question isn't what the people who changed the, the, the recent in, or added it to the fundamental, what they want, but what do you think recent means? What do each of you think recent means? And back in 1984 and 2003, there was a survey done of Adventist uh, scientists in North American colleges, Adventist colleges, and the, the, uh, it was kind of interesting about, um, oh, well, the error terms are the um, confidence intervals about plus or minus, I think, seven, eight percent. Um, and it looks like it dropped, uh, those who believe in less than 10,000 years ago, it dropped from 94 to 2003. But that might just be an, af uh, an effect of adding two more categories. So anyway, I think the take home message is that. Um, it's about a 60-40 split um, with about 40% saying less than 10, 60 saying something else, and then about 20% uh, talk about what I guess is called um, theistic evolution, I guess. Okay. Um, your, your class here, uh, I guess only six of you um, expressed a view and uh, about half of those who, and of course, when, we have, when you have six, I mean, the numbers maybe don't mean anything in terms of a collective, but half said uh, less than 10, um, 17 less than 100,000. Um, in other words, um, about 30% uh, say six, 50, so that's 80% less than 10. So, um, Okay, that's fine. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of difference of opinion inside our faith community about this topic. One of the other classes took this and 60% uh, said, well, no, when you talk about recent, you're talking about billions of years. Um, and the others, uh, see, what was it, 20, almost 30% says, I don't know, and I don't think it makes any difference. So there's quite a diversity of views. Uh, and if you, uh, if you had been here or wanted to or, or would or thought about it, um, if, you, if you don't, you, if, if your own personal views are that, no, it, it has to be younger than, pick a number, 10,000, six, whatever, presumably this means you don't accept the data from most, if not all, the scientific data methods, and there are a whole bunch of them, as you probably know, which gives much older ages, directly or indirectly, uh, for living organisms on, on planet Earth. So we won't go through. We're only going to talk about one. 
um, and what some of the information about that one. Uh, my granddaughter told me to say, make sure you tell them that God created radiocarbon dating. Uh, it's supposed to be a little joke, but I mean, I don't hear anybody laughing in here. Okay, sorry. Um, he also created science, but we won't get into that. All right, um, I'm going to assume that all of you have a kind of a feel for this. Uh, it is the principal isotopic dating method uh, for uh, up to about 50,000 years uh, for living, once living organisms. Uh, remember, it only works on once living organisms. Uh, you can't date a rock with radiocarbon. It's considered in my field, in archaeology, a lot of other fields now, lake quaternary geology, and uh, disconfirmation or confirmation of uh, um, the age of cultural objects. Um, the gold standard, uh, if you've got a C14 date and it's done right and it's done well on the right material, it's probably, it's probably roughly correct. Um, and now, radiocarbon dating, there's more dates run for climate studies and climate change than for archaeology or geology now, hydrology. Um, zero. Uh, most of the original C14 dates were on archaeological or lake quaternary geology research, but that's not true now. As I said, you've got a lot, tens of thousands of dates a year dealing with climate change issues. Um, kind of a radiocarbon dating has been around for about 60 years. Uh, and there's all kinds of many, many investigators, three or four generations of investigators. I guess two or three, to be accurate. Um, there are anomalies. Every, every technique has an anomalies. Uh, and they've been studied in great detail. Most of the reasons why you get problematical results are, are known, uh, or kind of known. Um, and it's everybody, all the f scientists in their field know how important radiocarbon dating is. It's, a major, a major um, impact on um, how chronometry was done in the sciences for the last recent, very geologically recent period, uh, 10, 000, uh, 50,000 years. Now you can get a date of 70,000, 75,000, but you got to really work at it, and you have to have a lot of sample, and you have to have a lot of money, and it takes a lot of work, but you can do it. Um, but you can get a routine, um, you can get a routine dates up to 50 now without any trouble, and you don't take much sample anymore. Um, at least that's the opinion of the Nobel Prize uh, Committee, uh, its impact. In archaeology, it's been profound, well, in prehistory, in the prehistoric archaeology. I love this quote, this is from a friend who's passed away now. Without the C14 time scale, prehistorians would still be, whoops, still be fla uh, floundering, I love the word, in a sea of imprecisions, sometimes bred of inspired guesswork, but more often of imaginative speculation. <laughs> that was chronology, pre prehistoric chronology before C14 in many respects. Um, it isn't, everyone, oh, I don't think anybody disagrees now, it is the most important discovery of 20th century archaeology although it was not done by archaeologists, it was done by a chemist. And the geologists know how important it is um, for the late Pleistocene. Um, it also has been very determinative on a number of things. Um, you know, the Shroud of Turin you may have heard about. Bear, is it real? Bearer cloth. Uh, so the plant had to be the first century AD if it is. And three uh, labs dated it. Oh, that's one 20 years ago. And the average age is about 700 years, so it's medieval. So it can't be anything associated with Jesus, a historic Jesus. Um, also, there's a wood, I don't know if you know the history of this, there's all kinds of uh, people who say they found the Ark, ark um, and the uh, problem was, uh, what evidence do you have? Well, one person what was this, back in the late 50s, early 60s? Brought a piece of wood down. And we, nobody quite knows how this got distributed around the labs. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 
uh, around the labs. But anyway, there was a whole bunch of labs. I got a piece, UCLA, when I was a grad student, UCLA got a piece. I actually gave a piece, uh, well, we ran a piece at uh, Irvine and the AMS system. So, so they're all about the same. Um, it dates to the early Middle Ages. So I'm sorry, this, unless, unless um, the flood occurred during the Middle Ages, we're in trouble. Um, doesn't work. All right, anyway. Um, this is the model, and there's a lot of bus uh, busy stuff in there. And, and if someone has some a little hazy on some of the details, we'll get back uh, if you want me to talk about it. Uh, but to move on to do what we want to do, uh, let's just say that the model that is used uh, is uh, or describes if you make certain assumptions. Uh, if you understand the production distribution of C14, of natural C14, in one, once living organisms, um, you can use the, the relationship between the state, one of the sta uh, ion radioactive isotope C14 and the one stable isotope C12, uh, can you be used to define a time interval uh, since that organism died. Uh, and you can do that by measuring the residual amounts of C14 uh, that is, that's in there now. But to do that, to make to go from that ratio to a number, a date, um, and convert the residual amount of C14 you measure um, in that sample, you have to have a series of assumptions be fulfilled. And most, uh, I spent my career trying to figure out why some dates are wrong, and a lot, most of my most of my colleagues do the same thing. So the the question is, what are the assumptions? And those are key uh, to getting a relatively accurate uh, estimate of age based on a stable isotope ratio, um, um, isotope ratios. One assumption, and the key assumptions is. When things are alive, they all have had the same C14 content in their bodies while they're alive. It doesn't make any difference if they're alive today or to live 10,000, uh, 10, 20, 50, whenever. That's the biggie. That's the big assumption. Okay. Uh, there's other assumptions which do are v v uh, vary, um, uh, and you know, let you know the half-life. You've got to assume that, and you have to assume you can make a relatively precise and accurate measurement of the residual C14. But the biggie, there's the biggie, all right? Uh, how do you know what the original activity in that sample was when it was 10,000 years ago? Well, the main thing is you've got to assume that the C14 production rate and the C14 decay rate is in equilibrium, OK? So that was the original assumption. Um, which was known not to be good reasonably to 10%. You know, we, they originally assumed plus or minus 10% kind of thing. Um, if all of the assumptions hold, including that one, you can then theoretically make a measurement of how much has remained in a sample and infer how long it's been since it died. So if it's 12% of modern, it's about 50, uh, 20,000 years old since it died. If there's um, two, per, two tenths of a percent, it's about 50,000 years. Simple, simple, simple. Question is, is that right? Is that assumption right? When uh, Libby, you want to see how to get a Nobel Prize? That's how you get a Nobel Prize. You just need what? How many data points? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you get a Nobel Prize. Uh, because when that was done in the 19, late 1950, uh, late 40s, it was a tour de force. It was an analytical tour de force to be able to get those numbers. And if you plot them against assumed what you assume the uh, half life is, um, you get a. You, you should not get a straight line. <laughs> you should get a, a, a curved line, like or with an exponential function. <clears throat> because uh, it's an exponential decay f function. So um, everything looked hunky-dories. So everything seemed to behold to something around 
10% to the last 4,500 years. But, well, maybe we should have stopped right there. <laughs> Don't do anything more. It works. <laughs> Go away. No, sorry. Science doesn't work that way. Um, in 1952, by that time, they had some more dates on the early, earlier end of the early part of the historical, which is around 5,000 BP. And they noticed, even Libby noticed, that things were not working like they should. Things were too young as you come back farther. And it doesn't make any difference. Libby got the Nobel Prize in 1960 uh, for uh, the C14, uh, for the reasons we've already said. And why do I, here's a, if you can't read Swedish, here's the, uh, uh, here's the translation of, into uh, uh, English. And the reason I list this here is because, if you'll do it, um, archaeology, the only time you'll see archaeology in a Nobel Prize certificate is this one. I wish they had it spelled it right. They spelled it wrong. <laughs> but there we are. We can't have everything, can we? Okay. And he was a very interesting guy. I was, I was a graduate student in his lab. He was on my doctoral committee. Um, fascinating man. I won't tell you. I won't, there's a mixed audience here, so I won't uh, tell you some of the special stories about him. Um, so as we got more and more dates, um, it, what was seemed to be happening is, OK, if you go up to only uh, pick a number, say 4,000 BPs, 5,000 BP, everything looks OK. But if you go beyond that, uh, things start, these dates start to get too young. Uh, and the question is, what, why? What is the reason for the, looks like an anomaly, uh, in the dates? Um, he published a paper in 63 after he'd got the Nobel. And so if you, if you give a paper to journals and you have Nobel Prize, they don't even send it out for review. No, that's not true. <laughs> uh, and they should have sent this one out for review. <laughs> because he rude the day he published this paper. Anyway, um, he said, basically, um, is C14 dates too young 5,000 years ago? Or do the Egyptologists not know what they're talking about <laughs> for that period? <laughs> and of course, the Egyptologists were not too happy with that, and they got themselves together and organized. Ah, there's my, there's my favorite Egyptian uh, site, ancient Egyptian. Most of you have been to Egypt, I assume. This is uh, Zoser's um, funerary complex. What a, what a super site. Anyway, um, so that's the question he raised. But he published some tree ring dates, some tree ring dates uh, in that paper, which showed the same offset getting radiocarbon dates too young as you go back. Um, so when, in 1965, when, by, by 65, there's a whole bunch of tree ring dates, uh, the C14 dates on tree rings, uh, we're showing that if you had a C14 date of 4,500 uh, BC in this case, uh, then, the actual age is, is 5,200. So there is an offset, a clear offset going on here. Radio, remember, uh, there's a, here's a mantra. Radiocarbon dates past 3,000 BC are too young, not too old, too young. OK? Um, <coughs> uh, now, dendrochronology was used for this, and this was introduced in the United States by, Elliot, by Andrew Elliot Douglas, A.E. Douglas. And he was an astronomer of all things. He wanted to see if there any relationship between tree rings and sunspots. And also, he grew up in the Northeast, and he wanted to get away from Northeastern winters, so he wanted to go to Arizona. <laughs> so he started a tree ring lab at the University of Arizona. Uh, and the basic idea is very straightforward. Uh, and it's been known since Aristotle, uh, certain species of trees living in certain kinds of environments will deposit 
what appears to be annual rings um, in which you've got the separation between the rings has to do with size of the cells. So you've got heart, once the thing, heartwood is established in a ring, uh, there is no, uh, that, and that was a big problem. Uh, did, did, from us using it for, I'm sorry, using it for a uh, C14 dates uh, for dating, you had one of the questions was, once are the tree rings in the trees, are they, when they're laid down, uh, isotopically separate, or is a, is a crosstalk between them? Oh, that was a huge problem, huge, huge problem. Uh, they settled it finally. They finally figured it out that once you became heartwood, there wasn't any, f didn't get my feedback. All right, so in conifers, you will have, in the majority of cases, annual tree rings, and they will be isotopically isolated. There are exceptions, and everybody worries about the exception. So if you've got a, um, you have a series of tree rings, uh, the, they will vary in their s particular um, situation, physical characteristics, based on changes in various environmental variables, which are different for different species in different environments. Um, so if you can bring together a, a series of contiguous rings, they'll form a sequential pattern, and you can interlace them, where, as you were, and you can uh, work back uh, by overlapping and, and uh, determining this. For no living tree, you work with dead trees, uh, deadfalls, etc. Now, for C14 purposes, uh, the original tree rings they did were northern, uh, northern hemisphere um, sequoias, etc. But the uh, the blockbuster data set came from the bristlecone pines here in California, uh, and they used both uh, living trees, and which I think, what's the oldest, four, five? I keep forgetting what the oldest living one is. 4,700, okay, thank you. But most of the da data, come f data for the study came from the deadfalls, not from the living trees. Uh, and how many of you have been up there? Oh. Gotta go up. World famous. <laughs> World famous place. Uh, don't go there in the winter. <laughs> go, there, go there in the summer. <laughs> yeah. And there's a certain tree that's the oldest, Methuselah. Uh, the only special people know where it is. Just some of us uh, radiocarbon people know where it is. We're sworn to secrecy. Okay, so in 1970, uh, Hans Seuss at La Jolla published the data set based on the Ferguson work. Um, Ferguson did the tree rings, Hans Seuss did the measurements, and this is the kind of numbers they got. Um, now, there's been criticism of West because nobody, he never published his original data, but people at the tree ring lab went back and looked at it, and they've redone a lot some of his, and there it's roughly, you know, plus or minus three or four percent. It's roughly right. Um, anyway, as expected, um, both the tree ring, earlier tree rings, and the historical data um, began to show that as you go back in time, the C14 agents are too young. And then he extended it with his data set out to roughly 75. And then there was a break in the original, and then he filled it in later, um, between seven and 8,000 BP. All right, so that's the 1970, well, 1973, actually. Um, so by six or 7,000, what we call calendar years, or calibrated years BP, before present, um, radiocarbon ages are about 800 years too young. All right, um, now, when I was in grad school, back in the Middle Ages, um, we were hope, hoping that, uh, you see that drift down is the magnitude of the offset beginning to decline, and hope a hope a hope. <laughs> uh, regretfully, 
okay? We were hoping when some more stuff came. There's the SUS data, 70. Did, does the offset begin to decline? But many, many, invest, many other investigators, particularly in Europe, got in the game and did a lot of European uh, furs and conif others, conifers in, I don't know, in Scotland, in, in oaks in Germany, right, exactly, buried out of, out of river valleys, yeah, that's kind of stuff. Uh, and, oh, sorry about that. It takes off again. Um, so there you are. And then if you jump forward to 2014, which is the current um, assembly of internationally agreed upon, it goes out to now we can, well, the actual tree wings themselves, continuous for northern hemisphere, will go to 15,000 now. Uh, there are arguments about oh, I would say plus or minus 30, 40 years, but those are arguments among details, among specialists, you know how people are. Like have, somebody asked you to new dissertation, so they're gonna argue about 20 years. So you get a dissertation. You were wrong. I'm right. That's my dissertation. <laughs> this is particularly true in Europe. Because they're, they're, they're still hot about this stuff. All right, well, then past 15,000, uh, there's a whole bunch of other proxy records used uh, to extend this on corals, varved lake sediments, for nifera, et cetera, et cetera. And they um, trying to, um, only, a, I'd say maybe a 20 people in the world can put together the data sets and understand them. Uh, and I happen to, there's one down at Irvine where I go every week. Uh, he's one of them, <laughs> so I have confidence in him. Uh, okay, so we can work them back now. It's worked back to about 50,000 years, and that's what was called INCAL 14. That's the internationally agreed upon calibration curve for radiocarbon dates for, northern Calif uh, for the northern hemisphere. There's a southern hemisphere offset a little bit. Okay. Um, so by about 20,000 years, Cal BP, um, C14 value, values are about 4,000 years, too young, too young. Uh, now, we, we say, everybody says the calibration data for greater than 20,000 BP is a work in progress. <laughs> now, that's, that's subtle. <laughs> it means we got a lot of work to do. Right? And they do, and they agree, they agree. So they're putting out a new one in, uh, there'll be Cal, INCAL 18, and there will be some shifts, minor shifts, in this curve. Okay, what's in, why? What's the reason uh, for all of these um, variations? Well, there's a long-term component, and that's been attributed largely to the intensity of the dipole magnetic field of the Earth. Um, you know that right now the North Seeking Pole and uh, if, you take a if you take a compass, it points you know, a particular way. Uh, it, oh, over the geologic time, that has flipped back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so, and some are arguing that we're, we're right now in the middle of a switch. We will see a switch. Well, I won't, I'll be dead. But my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren will see, probably see a reversal. Uh, and then all kinds of interesting things will happen, which I'm not, uh, I'm not competent to, to judge uh, what will happen. It's not going to be catastrophic, it's just going to be kind of, uh, we have to worry about some stuff. Um, it, okay, so that, um, as you know, uh, a compass has an orientation, both up and down and left and right, or whatever. You, uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the field intensity, the intensity of the field, which varies over time as well. Okay, and it's a very complicated thing, I'm told, by geophysicists who work on it. There are regional and continental magnetic fields that are superimposed on top of the dipole field. Dipole just means two fields, two oriented north, south. Okay. Um, now, what we, uh, over a period of the last 30 years, they've been working on trying to rec reconstruct 
what's this been like? And this is the uh, reconstruction of the trend of the intensity of the dipole field beginning about 40,000 years ago. Um, and it's been increasing. And then it decreased very rapidly in the last, um, what, four or 5,000 years. Um, and they think maybe uh, that's one indication that things are going to be ch start changing here. OK, now when you change that, you de decrease the production rate of C14 quite dramatically All right, over that 40,000 period. And then that's translated into why you have this effect of the plus or minus, why you have the variations in a time uh, based on radiocarbon dates. Okay, uh, that's quite a tour de force. That data, those data sets have taken 20, 30 years, 25 years to come up with, and uh, it's quite remarkable, I find. If you want to see all this, uh, I have a book, um, which I don't get much royalties on, <laughs> uh, talking about radiocarbon dating and archaeology. And some of this is in there. And then there's another book coming out, which will have some of this too, uh, if you're interested. There's also the short-term stuff, uh, and superimposed on the uh, long-term. There are sometimes called, they originally were called DeVries effects, and are still, because uh, back in the 50s, early 60s, well, late 50s, uh, a uh, Dutch geophysicist by the name of Hansel de Vries first noticed them for recent materials last three or four hundred years. And so they've been named de Vries effects. Uh, we sometimes call them affectionately warps in the C14 time scale, time spectrum. Um, sorry. So if you go back and look at the long term, on top of them are imposed these wiggle, quote unquote wiggles. We also call them wiggles. Um, so you have a number of, of these short-term changes. And that's, those are attributed in large, uh, uh, to a large degree with the magnetic field of our sun and various aspects of solar activity, the solar flares and solar winds and that kind of stuff. Um, the sun, as you know, is a very active body. A very um, magnetic field is very dramatic. It throws out. Uh, part, uh, plasma and other things over a period of time. And it's very nice that we have a magnetic field of the Earth that shields us from that, because if we didn't, we wouldn't be here. We'd be dead. Or at least it wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be a carbon form. We might, we might be a silicon-based um, uh, bi biology. How do you like those? How do you like that? Okay. And then there are also changes in the short term due to uh, the rates of exchange of carbon isotopic values between the marine, oceans, and the terrestrial. Um, and that reflects the fact about 70% of all C14 on Earth uh, is in the oceans, and most of that is in the deep oceans. And some of that uh, continuously comes up, called up upwelling, uh, and dilutes the surface oceans and then gets into the atmosphere. So you have a very complicated uh, uh, if you want to see the formulas that they use for that, you know, there are pages and pages and pages of differential, <laughs> differential uh, 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 calculus. Okay, so uh, if all the C14 assumptions are true, then you get a straight line. Is that true? No, obviously. Um, is it constant? Is there a constant offset? You know, everything is always too old or too young. Uh-uh, sorry about that. Um, so the point of it, there's no constant offset. There is a variable offset, and it increases with time back to about 27,000 BP. And we call that the main trend, okay, in the change. And then on top of that, if you expand that, you can see it all, here's the short term variability. Uh, for example, at that interval, you'd have maybe four or five hundred data points, just to document that. There's thousands of, of data points on tree rings and other things um, that documents this. Uh, 
So what, what the take-home message is, sorry, the take-home message is the rates of change in C14 time and rates of change in calendar or real time are not the same. All right? And then uh, the effect is, this is a plot of the variability. You, you take away the main trend, and then what's left is this. And at different times, you're going to have warps of many hundreds of years which, in which you can't use the C14 to distinguish anything in those two or three hundred year periods. All right? Uh, so that you, uh, radiocarbon leaves you blind for those periods. They've got to do something else. Uh, for example, there you've got 2,500 BP. Uh, that's, your war that's the warp. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the, we should call it the Nineveh warp. <laughs> um, uh, what that usually also means is that um, depending on where you are in the C14 time spectrum, uh, you're going to get, quote unquote, more precision, inherent precision in the C14 date. For example, if you happen to be unlucky to have a C14 date of 7950 plus or minus 20 years BP, the best you can do is a 320 year warp. You can't get any better than that. On the other hand, uh, if, you're a good, if you're a good boy that week and you have a state of 807520, you only have to worry about a 60-year warp, all right? So um, we always tell graduate students to get those kind of samples. Don't get the other kind. Okay, um, moving on to uh, uh, another assumption. One of the assu other assumptions is, of course, that we can measure. <laughs> it, it does help to have a model, and you can't do the measurements. You know, big deal. Luckily, we can do the measurements. <coughs> Um, so it be we began with decay, what's called decay counting, if anybody wants to know what this is all about. I, my lab ran from 1973 to 2006. Well, UCLA ran from 61 to 3. UC San Diego, oh, excuse me, from 60 to 96. So uh, most of the decay counting labs have shut down because it's now obsolete for, a lot, for many things, not everything. It's been replaced with accelerator mass spectrometry. This is the one at Livermore. That's the big machine. That's a 10 million volt machine. But you don't need that big anymore. You can run with smaller systems, and that's the one at Irvine. Oh, there. Got a mistake there. OK, so this is specifically designed for C14. OK, now, um, when, I, when I'm talking about 10,000, 20, 30,000, I understand we, in our faith community, we have some issues about those numbers. Um, so how would one approach um, calling into question dates older than six to 10,000 years? Okay, now one approach that you may have heard of is the question the half-life value of C14. Um, this was a rare, rare taken. It was never taken by anybody who knew anything about nuclear physics. Um, even by those who were young Earth creationists, young life creationists, uh, they thought that was a lousy idea. And, uh, and um, Bob Brown, of course, being a physicist, uh, never thought that was going to work, uh, and so never uh, supported that idea. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, another one that's uh, popular today uh, is the idea that you can detect C14 in fossil organics. Um, you can detect indigenous C14 in fossil organics, um, and that includes coal, limestone, and even dinosaur bones, which uh, my, 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 my graduate students always chuckle about that one. But um, of course, all of these are in, in excess of hundreds of thousands of year old, year old by the scientific community. So that's just absurd. Uh, but what's the problem? Well, there's a problem, because in AMS systems, you put in a piece of coal, and your, your system is going to say, there's some C14 in there. There's a C14 signal coming in your system. And everybody who runs machines knows that. That's called background. OK. So, um, but you, I, I constantly see this in the, in the young Earth creationist 
or young life creationist literature, uh, that's how somehow significant. And anybody knows how those machines work always kind of scratch their head and says, what are they talking about? Um, I, I can't go into the details here. I'd be happy to at some other time. Uh, I'm publishing a paper along with three or four, uh, two other colleagues. It'll be out in the January, February, March issue of Radio Carbon in 2018. Um, been accepted. Uh, as we're just cleaning it up. Uh, to explain exactly why uh, this is not a viable idea, okay, and it just uh, we we explain we explain in exquisite detail about how how an accelerator works uh, uh, for C14 and why there's no such animal as a bacteria uh, a background free system, uh, and there isn't any in another other area either. It's called blanks or background. There's no system I know. Uh, that doesn't have a blank. I don't care if it's C14 or measuring DNA, you know. Um, and so somebody just does not misunderstood that. Okay, uh, is there any other? Yes, there is a very, very reasonable approach if you wish to say, hey, there's something wrong with real old C14 dates. And it's one that the late Robert Brown, I call it the Brown hypothesis. Um, he published a paper in, when was it? 79. Uh, in which he said, I think, here's what the problem with C14 dates is it has to do with the flood. And the flood caused, not, he doesn't explain how, but let's just, let's not argue about the how part. Uh, there's no mechanism, there's no physical mechanism how this could work that I know of. and I'm. Who am I? I'm not a geologist. Anyway, um, he said what's happened is right at, after the flood, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere just skyrocketed. Very quickly went up. That's his C thing, okay? Um, this is what the, the A and B, or the st or A, is, A is steady state, which is we know it doesn't true, and B is what we think is the case. Um, another way to Okay, uh, you know, what happened was that the C14, C12 ratio uh, increased rapidly. That means as, as it went up, uh, the pseudo ages that dropped very dramatically as you go up very quickly. So in a thousand years, you had, I understand, if I understand this right, uh, you had radiocarbon dates giving you at the beginning um, 50,000 years and a thousand later, it, you're, it, they're giving you 10,000 years or 8,000 or something within a thousand years. Wow, anybody who knows anything about radiocarbon dating would sure take, sure take notice of that. Okay, this is another way of, uh, of illustrating it. Okay, how do you test that? Ah, oh, you can. Um, it's very easy. I mean, it's very straightforward. You know, no complicated, no complication at all. All you do is find. <laughs> All, all you do <laughs> is find a tree that was growing within a thousand years of the flood, uh, assuming you believe there was a universal flood recently. Okay. Um, is it I'm one of the Adventists who don't think there is. But anyway, if you do, super. Okay, all you got to go is find a log. Unless you assume there was no trees growing after the flood. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but let's assume the trees were there and they were growing and they were laying down rings. Okay? And so you find a tree. It's simple. Just go out and find a tree. <laughs> That's all you have to do. <laughs> An old enough tree. Okay? And so the tree, whoops, sorry. The tree began to grow within a short period of time at the end of the flood. Okay? All right? And each ring represents a year following. Okay, so all you have, all you have to do, and it's it's not easy, so I accept that. But you know, it's relatively simple. You take a tree ring section, say twenty contiguous rings, or thirty. It doesn't make a difference. Contiguous. Right? You have to demonstrate that they're contiguous rings. They run next to each other. No no fooling around there. Okay. 
And then we know, at least recent <laughs> experiments, once it becomes hardwood, okay, everything's fine, you've got an isolate. All right. So each ring is separated. So you have sep tw uh, 20 or any, it doesn't make a difference, let's say 20. 20 separate samples, okay, over the 20 years or whatever, 20 years. It's just the illustration for this purpose. Okay, simple. All you do is run the radiocarbon dates on those 20. And here's an example of a data set that would uh, cause any radiocarbon specialist to say, wah! And then this is one that we expect, would disconfirm. Okay, so if we find the following, you have supported the Brown hypothesis. Okay, you don't need much. And this would be a very, very interesting data set. Um, there's a lot of stipulations and ipso, you know, things you'd have to wave your arms about. But um, if, if you do this again and again with the same sample, or with, with a sample, another tree right next to it, same thing, and you duplicate this, I'll assure you, my colleagues and I will pay great attention, and you will be the subject of a great amount of interest. Okay. Uh, if, on the other hand, this is what we expect will happen, something like that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just saying here that uh, we do need a few simple uh, stipulations. Uh, just so everybody's on the same page as to uh, so to maximize the chance that we'd have agreement about what the data means. Okay? So there's not a fudging later. Um, and you get, if you can give me a tree, you get 10 free C14, AMS based C14 dates. No questions asked. Well, there'll be a lot of questions asked, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you get free, free dates, 10 free dates. All right? Courteous, uh, courtesy of one of my support um, funds. Because although I, I'm retired, I'm emeritus, I have, still have money, funds. Okay, supposing you did it, and it comes out the way you want it to come out, um, You'll, you'll be taken, for the first time, young earth creationists, young life creationists, long, young life actually, will be taken seriously in the scientific community. I, I know quite a bit about the scientific community in the radiocarbon field. You will be taken seriously. Particularly if, this, if, if I run the dates, or if the dates are run in a lab I, I'm attached to. It doesn't make any difference. That's not important. Any, any research lab. Any AMS research lab. You just get them free. That's what. <laughs> um, and I assume if you get confirmatory data, you're going to be able to get money from the young Earth, young, you're going to be able to get money from geoscience, right? GSA, uh, GSA, geoscience, to continue working and see what's going on. Uh, on the other hand, it, let's assume that you do the experiment several times and it doesn't come out right like you want it, but you'll still be known to you really are serious scientists for a change uh, and actually have data that's relevant to this issue uh, that you can present. But it, you did the experiment, didn't work out. More power to you, okay? Um, what would be the negative outcome of not being able to confirm? Well, it would fail to provide support for the Braun hypothesis and it would be reasonable to conclude that the Brown hypothesis has, in this instant, been falsified. In that instance. Okay. Um, so you could have a number of interpretations. There is no recent worldwide flood. Did not occur. Uh, the flood event was local, localized, regional. Uh, trees that could support the Brown hypothesis are so too deeply buried. Uh, yeah, I suppose. I suppose you could go there. Um, the offsets predict to exist, but I'm sorry, but for some unknown process has modified their C14 content, 
just enough in each tree ring to counteract the effect of being sought. That's called special pleading. Um, now, there are other interpretations that you can draw, but they're, most of them are not scientific. Um, so, sorry about that. Okay, summary. Ah, we have time to talk. Uh, the Brown hypothesis deals with the closely defined physical features of a natural object within a specific physical system and makes an explicit prediction. That is its great scientific virtue. It can be empirically tested with not a lot of whistles and bells problems. You get free C14 dates. And the outcome should be definitive, either confirm or not confirm. But I have this, we, ha we go through some of this in other th areas, and what happens is we get a mucked up thing. The data's in the middle. And then we do have real problems. Uh, well, let's hope this is not the case here. Um, w it, there's no question that getting an appropriate sample is not simple, um, but it have an immense benefit to your community, for the young, uh, young life creationist community. And even if you, it doesn't work out, um, you'll certainly have uh, validation. Uh, oh, I, I, okay, if it does work out, you've got a val first kinds of, first validation I know of in the literature of some very specific prediction of young life creationist uh, position. And even if you don't, comes that doesn't come out right, at least the scientific community will say, hey, they tried right, in a reasonable environment. Right? And they, they did all the right things. Didn't work out. Great. That's, we do that all the time. For every 10 I, bright ideas I have, you know, nine are wrong. Well, 20, one is right. <laughs> One out of twenty. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, uh. Well, to start out with, you may remember that I. Uh, is this on? Yeah, now it is. Uh, to start out, you may remember that I uh, uh, that I sent you a reference. Yes. And uh, I thought uh, I. I managed to find this morning uh -huh. uh, some data that I had uh, okay. taken from that reference. Okay, super. And that I thought I think uh, might be interesting to look at. Sure. So let me just plug in. Grab stuff. In the meantime, I'll be look, I'll be interested in looking at it. I I looked that over, and what I what I saw was um, okay. Hey, yeah, this, this is interesting. Don't you love that, though, Godfrey? That is sunrise. I think it's from the, and it's not from the space station, because it's too high. I think it's too high. I think it's from, gee, I don't know where it's from. You notice how thin the atmosphere is? Notice how thin it is? Uh, how do I, uh, do you have to do something special? No, just that? unplug it. Plug just yours in. Some that you have to oh no no I just kill it automatically kills it not a problem <coughs> I didn't know you had three first names Paul okay. oh can I make a comment on your first sentence at three at five thousand excuse me um. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Now th yeah. this is. Go ahead. Uh, I think may have the uh, the time going in a different direction, but it's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. Where here you have the the uh, calibration curve yeah. set off here, and then of course it keeps on going. Right. Uh, if you have a flood at uh, uh, let's say 2,300 or 4,000, uh, 3,500 BC or so you have basically, you should be heading up with an asymptote, and the slope of this line 
at about 5,000 years. If you're doing some kind of a, uh, this is an approximation, and so it may not be exactly accurate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the standard model, forgive me, this was well, done a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, Bart, Bart, you raise a very important thing. Evolution has nothing to do with any of the topics we're dealing with. Well, zero, zero. Uh, evolution zero. requires a longer model, but I agree with you that, it, uh, that not directly. It's a, it's, a, okay. it's a piece of propaganda. And, and for that sure. reason, I would prefer to now to use the, uh, the standard uh, geological model, probably, or something like that. Uh, the Masoretic model predicts a slope at about 5,000 years of around five, and it's not clear exactly how fast. Mm -hmm. um, the Septuagint model in that same era would predict a slope of around 2.3, 2, 2.5, depending on, you know, which model you pick. Um, in any case, this is uh, Campbell and Baxter, the, the reference that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, this is confidence uh, uh, limits, which is 1.96 times the standard deviation times about 1.3, because the standard deviation really isn't the real standard deviation if you were to do all that stuff. But, um, and so here's what you get for um, BORTH1. You can have, have this erratic data, this, uh, uh, Right. That uh, that kind of stuff goes all the way up to, from you know five thousand five hundred down to what four uh, five thousand one hundred in one log at, mm -hmm. and if fifty years right span, which is kind of crazy. Well, wait a minute. What you got is a uh, if you a fast if you, change in the C fourteen activity right at about um, let's see what do you got what's it yeah what what's your uh, what fifty what is that fifty percent of uh, this is this is the radiocarbon years using the standard. Right. I mean, what's your other what's your other scale? Zero fifty five fifty is fifty percent. This is uh, uh, ring years from fifty to one hundred. Uh, I mean, from uh, which presumably is actual time, but we don't know where on the scale that would be. Oh, these are that's in years. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, so you have, you're having fourth four. Yeah. Again, you're having erratic data. Although you know, maybe if you just uh, this was an error, and we can move it down here somewhere. You can probably get somewhere with that. You can't move data around like that. Um, it certainly, uh, the calibration curve, I don't think, really has that kind of swing in the standard thing. Oh, yes, the slope, it does. Slope, interestingly, oh, yes, is it does. less than usual. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> um, and, um, and then you have board six, which again has this kind of crazy erratic right. data. And again, right. it really doesn't fit the calibration curve. I haven't shown you that, but right. Uh, right. Uh, you can do that. Yeah, it doesn't fit the calibration curve that they had when right. that data was published. Right. That's correct. Um, and then uh, board six, which again kind of swings up and down and right. Uh, right. considerable. Right. So something is going on, but we don't know what, and I'm not sure I would put too much weight on that. Well, yet. wait a minute. When was this published? Um, nineteen. I th think. Um, what was the original 79. date? Seventy nine. This is done at the end the of the seventies. Uh, it's at the end of the seventies. The old method. A lot of changes. Yeah, a lot of place. changes since okay. then. This is right. what we have, though, from that era. Right. Where we have actual single trees that were right. being have recorded. You looked, have you looked at the, the data set that we use now? For the, well, for the I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in um, what I might call unprocessed or raw data. That's why the, uh, doing it all on one tree is particularly interesting. Yeah, it is. No, it is. Uh, you know, SLOS 1 actually has passively linear data. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the slope there is 1.94, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a little higher than you would expect. But it's only 50 years, and it's maybe years. there's some place in the curve where it I'm not fit. I'm not surprised at all, that data. Yeah. That's typical of a, some, a number of periods. Stolford 1 Holocene. is kind of interesting. Here, instead of having it go up like one of the other logs did, right. it goes down, goes down and right. then coming back up. Right. Um, and again, the slope is 0 0.44 if you just plug the numbers in and crank. Right. Um, this is an interesting one, a Stolford 5. Right. It fits a straight line fairly well. Mm, you know, 
maybe it may mean something the slope there is 1.95 mm-hmm. um, which again is going high we're going to take that one later on and we're going to put it into the standard this curve. Is a, this is a 300 year run, right? Yeah. Okay. It's that, that's a nice run, actually. I'd like to see data like that or maybe even bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and here you can see where all these crazy things are. Right. Um, here's the calibration curves that are going well. You know, they don't really fit the curve. This one does go way mm-hmm. down. Right. Goes way up. Right. And Right. You, know, you can do what you want to with those. No, you can't. There are there are limits. There well, are, there are limits to um, what you can do. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that I can make a real good case that they fit anybody's curve. Well, wait a minute. Um, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But when now, you say shipping the curve, do you have you ever gone back and read how they calculate the curve based on the data sets that they we have now? Um, at one point, I I did. Well, you know all about marking. You know about all about um, ways of dealing with outliers and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, in any case, this is this is an interesting one. You see, you could fit it to the curve here. It does have a dip, but it doesn't have near the dip that the that the cur- that the uh, right. that the sample itself does have. Right. You can try to put it here. Interestingly enough, this is a point in the curve where it goes straight up, uh-huh. and now you get to explain, right. uh, which, you know. Which calibration uh, curve are you using there? The, the uh, it was the standard, uh, I think Cal what? Pearson. Or, which one? Uh, it was the one that we had in, what, 1979? It was actually, um, I think it was the second iteration, but. Oh, well that's back in the Middle Ages for yeah, the C14. Yeah, that's true. Um, it was the data that I had at the time. Okay. Um, and you can see that you could try to put it in something like here, but yeah, uh, you're well outside of the 95% confidence limits sure. in this area. Sure. Um, this is an interesting one. This is, uh, uh, you can see one of them that's going, you know, if it's halfway decently through here, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to shift it over in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, this one down here fits halfway decently here. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's see, you're trying to deal with 500 years of the calibration yeah. curve? Right. Okay, well, supposing that you try to line up this part here, uh-huh. you can do that. Uh, then the, the only real problem with it seems to be that the calibration curve has this area that's kind of uh, one of those areas where the carbon-14 date stays uh, stable yeah. for, right. what, 120 right. years or so? Oh, sometimes it's more than that. Oh, yeah. Well, there's that one place where it's, uh, depending on which curve you're picking, it's 350 years. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Uh, <laughs> and we had some fun with the Nineveh bones on that one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you picked the absolute wrong... Oh, <laughs> wrong. sorry about that. This is it the data the, we have. It's the longest, it's the longest yeah. uh, flat in the C14 curve for whole, the oh, whole thing. Oh, I know, scene. I know. You can pick those, uh, anyway, Paul. You, yeah, you know I know, so what I'm suggesting <laughs> is that, you know, maybe <laughs> this little area here that's flat might not be real, in which case you okay. have to wonder, maybe that area right there isn't real. Okay. And if you just snip that off and see what happens. Ah, is that all you do? Okay. Then you get actually a pretty decent fit. Uh, now, is okay. that fair? Uh, well, let's put it this way. Maybe it's fair, maybe it's not. Uh, but this is one of those areas where I think more research should be done. Good. And that's one of the reasons why, if we can find a tree that will satisfy the parameters, I'm with you on uh, doing the test. Super. Anyway. Super. Yep. A whole at all fine. Now, uh, let me just comment on something. You're dealing with 500 years here. Right. So you're dealing with 500, uh, what is it, 44 to 56, about five, yeah. 500 years. You see, that's what's so nice about the Brown hypothesis. You're not have, you wouldn't have to worry about this. One, the other scale would be 50,000. The scales were, would be order of magnitude different, so you'd see it, you'd easily see it. 
if it really exists, right? Well, that's the thing. If we can get an, uh, one that has a carbon-14 date, date old enough, then oh, well. uh, there are several of them. Uh, there's several hypotheses that could all be tested at the same time. Super. And uh, be my guest. That's uh, that's what I would intend to do. Excellent. I, I hope you can come up with a good one. You you have a tendency to be able to find the ones that really are interesting. I must say. Well, we uh, we do the best we can. Uh, there's a comment over there. As soon as I untangle myself here. What did I do? Let's turn the lights on here. Uh, okay, oh. got it, got it. Thank you. Oh, ouch. Uh, you know what you should do is take your data or what you're using, go to the modern one, go to Incal 14, and and see what they've done with that period. It will be interesting. I noticed that there's one other place where it really takes off and then it levels back off and actually curves down. Yeah, well now re published. remember, that's the area where we're working on. That's yeah. called a work in progress. That's usually a euphemism to, uh, somebody's waving their hands a lot. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as a biologist. Yes, sir. Uh, one who's thought and seen a lot of this. Uh -huh. The one thing I am, I'm, I'm searching for the right word. Skeptical wouldn't be right. Curious maybe is the right word. Mm -hmm. uh, in real biological processes, much of what you showed would simply be considered noise. Probably. Because you're at less than f often five to 10% the variability is restrictedly around the the line. Yeah. Right. I'm not I'm not sure how that That's because we're making how that supports a how those differences support any argument you want to come up with to in other words can you does a variability make comparison of different models much more difficult because it's what less than 10% Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, let me see. See if I can. Uh, maybe I don't understand your question. Well, we're seeing comment. lines go up and down. When I look at the, maybe I misinterpreted it. At the age scale, we're l looking at 50 to 100 years variability in this noise. If or I can mean, put it that a, way. A, a single radiocarbon age has a variability of, uh, our measurement has a, a measurement error of what? Is that what you're commenting on? No, I'm, I, I'm not questioning that. Oh, okay. I'm questioning how it contributes to the bigger picture one tries to build, well, you, build because uh, the variability is still around a line that seems like a reasonable fit, regardless, yeah, okay. of, uh, of, if, right. regardless of how you deal with the variability. It seems like the line, is, uh, the fitted line, yeah. should provide a basis for comparison better than looking at the degree of scatter. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that, this, is, this is an information question. Sure, no, no, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, if you're addressing the mechanisms by which they calculate the um, agreed upon calibration curve itself, if that's what you're addressing, your point is well taken. Um, we have to make those cali that calibration curve. Oh, I could put it up again if we can plug my. I want to plug my thing again. Uh, the calibration curve, the modern calibration curve, is made up of about five or six thousand data points, mm -hmm. roughly. Okay. Now, which are on super. Thank you. Which are on. Uh, in ter just, just taking the tree rings, let's just take trees, <coughs> the tree rings that are used. Um, for the last, say, 15,000 years, um, oh boy, here we go. Somebody pushed, a, somebody, somebody pushed a magic button and made this go up there. Is it? No, it isn't. Let me see. Anyway. Let me, let, let, let. 
Okay, how do we do that? Because I do want to answer your question. It's a great question. All right, let's see what we're doing here. Da 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 da. Uh, yeah. Is our genius here? Oh, the young man who is helping. You pushed a button. Oh, you pushed a button over there. Oh, magic. Okay, okay. I don't want to take time, so wait a minute. Let me see something here. Ta da. Yeah, well, there's one screen here. Yeah, let me see. Is this. Um, da da da. Let's see. Da. Swap screens. And then swap screens again. Click to exit. Now I can't see anything, so we'll do it a third thing. Don't you love technology? No. Oh, did it work? Oh, did I not wait quick enough? All right, let's just talk about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's easier to illustrate. Um, <clears throat> One problem that you've addressed is the density of the data points to infer a line. Which you do, you must do that all the time in curve fitting. Of course. Sure. And uh, f uh, for, the, for the last 15,000 years, the, the, the curve fitting program they use is, pretty sta is a standard one. OK. Um, because the density of their data points so those, I think the, the comment you made is not relevant to that, because the density is high enough. But there's another factor. Um, the inherent variability of a single radiocarbon sample <laughs> is not what we would like to t have you believe when we tell you a date. <laughs> so what else is new? Well, but it's not as bad. Yeah, I mean, generally. It's no, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's not too much worse, but it's just a tiny bit worse. We, we don't like to advertise that I c <laughs> that the C14 activity of spring wood and the uh, C14 activity in early wood, uh, I'm sorry, in late wood, uh, in the same tree ring. Uh, it, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. Same tree ring could vary by a percent. That's 80 years. OK? Now, what we hope happens, and we demonstrated this. There's been a number of papers published. That when you average that over a 10-year period, you, you typically average out that kind of variability. You hope. Unless you're in a bad part of the calibration curve. All right? So I think what you've raised is an important point. Uh, if you, if you know, uh, for someone who knows the literature, your point's well taken. However, it, what it does, it, it, affects, it affects only the edge of your infer inferences. Uh, instead of being 95% confident, uh, or, or um, put it backward, instead of being able to use standard statistics, you have to modify those statistics. In other words, it's maybe 95, it's not 95%, it's like 92 or 93, okay? So, uh, and for every case, it's a little different. Uh, there are mathematicians who like to play with radiocarbon dates. Uh, and they come up with some very interesting things, no question. They found uh, when you do, uh, what do you guys call it? Um, power functions. Uh, what are they called? Ah. Anyway, when you do power functions, you do find cyclic, uh, cyclical patterns. When you have enough data set, when you have enough data, you can really see. You can see, for example, you can see the uh, solar cycle. You can see the sunspot cycle in radiocarbon dates. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Transports? Say again. 
transforms like Fourier transforms? Fourier, yeah. They do highfalutin Fourier transforms. And they find, they can see in recent stuff, if it's done right, they can see the solar cycle <laughs> in, the, in the thing. So there's enough empirical evidence when we do things like that that we're actually seeing real effects. These are just not functions of uh, statistical function or functions of a system. But the C14 system is inherently noisy. But it's not that noisy. It's noisy at the level of maybe plus or minus three, four, or five percent. In my world, that is extremely consistent. Well, in our world, we're ecstatic if we can do that. I mean, when you deal with biological data, if you don't get get less than plus or minus 10 to 20 percent as your extremes of variability, you're doing really well. So yeah. I, all I'm saying is I'm not sure how the variability either affirms or questions the fitted oh. curve. Oh, no, it's degrees Because of it's a very right. small percentage of right, the data right, that, right. that give you the curve. Yeah, it's an it's a estimate of, um, uh, what, do we, what do we use? Um, I wish I had my statistician here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have, have one more very brief uh -huh. question. Right. If you were to resample the same tree ring, right. how we much do variability that. would you get? Uh, we did that. Uh, we redid a lot of the uh, new or original bristlecone uh, that Seuss did. Um, we found that we could get within um, sigma 0.3 about 80 or 90 percent of the time. I can give you the numbers if you want. <coughs> well, they're kind of interesting. Uh, it, what, what it does is, it, you see, I'm one of these people that are on your side. I think people use radiocarbon dating. Or they don't realize, uh, well, let me put it negative, uh, positive. They think radiocarbon dates give them more <coughs> precision than it can. And they want to use that very narrow precision to make a point, usually archaeological. And then if you take their data set and you say, oh, come on. You, you can't get that kind of precision with your numbers. You know. So I'm on your side. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple of questions, because I'm sort of confused. Um, uh, join the club. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if this question is for either of you, for both of you. But um, so couple questions, like one of them is, why would Brown uh, assume that the change of the carbon-14 concentration in the atmosphere, if I'm understanding correctly, would change over a 20-year period? Where does that assumption, did I understand that correctly? I'm not sure I understand. Oh, maybe I can answer that one. Uh, he wouldn't say over no. a 20-year period. He is saying over a a 500 year period yeah, or over something a thousand like that. Year, if, if you have a thousand years of real time, real time, thousand years of real time, if uh, his model, flood, I would assume we call it a flood model or something, yeah. uh, then the C14 difference in a thousand years of real time would be like 40,000 years. Okay, but my understanding is you're, you're, you're suggesting that a piece of wood with 20 rings. Yeah. So I think that's 20 years of real 20 years, time right. that uh, each, each uh, segment of that, you know, each ring yeah. should be assessed, okay? Yeah. So, so how does that 20 years fit within the 1,000 years of real time that you're talking about? I mean, you're asking for a 20-year period, well, right? Maybe you misunderstood. I don't think it'll happen. But I'm saying if you, somebody wants to do the experiment, more power to you. No, uh, I, I'm saying the Brown hypothesis. Yes, the Brown hypothesis that would say that if I'm right, if Brown is right, you find a piece of wood that was growing within 500 years of the flood, whenever that was, um, the, the, it should have, like, I don't know, let's, we'll pick a number, 20 rings. Yeah, and if you were in that 1,000 or 500 year interval, the radiocarbon age of each of those rings would be thousands of years difference if his model is right. 
Okay, so that gives me another question. But well, Paul, did is you that know? right? Is that is that? Uh, well, it depends question? on where you catch it. At, yeah, it's at where you Five thousand years using a kind of rough model. Uh, if you for the Masoretic flood, uh, sure. flood, you would right. have about five times four, five somewhere in there times the number of carbon fourteen years as you'd have ring years. Yeah. As you get further down, the effect would be more dramatic. Right. So exactly. Well, maybe this so it would, and, and the other thing is there may be some variability there. Right. Uh, so that maybe at some place there would be a, a plateau like we have now. Um, Could be. Until you actually do the data, you wouldn't know for sure. But the potential exists for finding carbon-14 years uh, skyrocketing in some particular area. And uh, finding that would be uh, news in the radiocarbon community. Oh, yeah. I'd, personally, I'd love to get, get to do that. So, There's so some, uh, it would be very interesting. So my, I don't think it'll happen, but it, if it does, boy. Just so my related question to yeah. that is why would, why would Brown or a young Earth creationist assume uh -huh. that the time in which the carbon-14 concentration in the atmosphere changed, yeah. that that change occurred over a period of 500 years as opposed to during the flood of like oh, a year oh, or oh, thereabouts? Oh, 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 I think I got it. You're absolutely right. I can't figure out why they, why do they need Sorry, Paul. Why do you need this uh, change so dramatic, so quickly? It's, one, it's the lethal idea. Five hundred years isn't idea. real quick. One year is real yeah, quick. Yeah, exactly. Why do you, you're, you're forced, you've, you've forced yourself into a black hole with that kind of an argument. I never understood why well, they do that. Well, I do, but it's a long story. I mean, it's, Paul, it's, can you, do you understand yeah. my question? No, I, I get it. I get it. I, I, I get well, it. Let me let me explain. Yes. You start out with zero, a percent at the well. Actually, there's a debate as to exactly where you start, but it's close to zero, if not zero. Right. Um, percent uh, radiocarbon uh, in what are presumably flood uh, buried deposits. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, and. By the time you get to, well, I'm comfortable with saying by the time you get to uh, 500 BC, you're pretty much on the money. And what percent is that? Uh, <laughs> uh, that would be, well, it depends on where you, where you put the flood. Uh, but, that, but in order to get from point A to point B, the curve has to rise. Yeah, well, let me also say what he's facing, what Paul and people who support his views, which number of in this room, I assume, they're facing an almost impossible task, it seems to me, from a scientific point of view. We know from the archaeological records and hundreds of thousands of radiocarbon dates, you've got sites in the Near East that go back five, six, seven, eight thousand, nine thousand, ten thousand. They're very different sites. You can't have all these things living at the same time. Uh, then you go back into the cave deposits. I mean, the, the whole idea just flies in the face of everything we know archaeologically what happened but, just in the Near East. But, but getting back to my question, because sure. I feel like you're addressing something that's not my question. OK, good. So to try to, try to clarify the question, um, sure. what, if, what if instead of the Brown model, because this, right. is, this challenge is based upon the Brown model, and the Brown model has, I think, an assumption that the concentration of, of carbon-14 in the atmosphere would change over a long period of time, like 500 years, okay? And, and what I'm saying is that's not a normal young Earth creationist model. The young Earth creationist model would say the flood happened, and so you have yeah. uh, a carbon-14 concentration, I mean, let's, let's say, flood happened at year 5,000, exactly, okay? okay. okay. So in uh, 5,001, the concentration was at one level, yeah. and then in 4998, it's at a different level. Right. Not that you take 500 years to change the carbon dioxide concentrations, the carbon-14 concentration, but it happened in like a year or two. It, wouldn't that be yeah. the normal, normal flood model? I don't know. I don't support the flood model myself, personally. Well, I'm asking Paul, I suppose. Paul. Well, maybe I can put it this way. Um, 
if yeah. if you assume that it just <coughs> suddenly popped up to let's say the mo the level that we have now at 3500 BC then it raises the question of what do you do with all of that data that seems to go back before that what yep. do you do with that data yep and uh, the Brown model at least puts that data into some kind of a historical context. Okay. Whereas okay. if you don't do that, right. then you have a whole bunch of dates which are kind of just floating in space. Yeah, and that's the criticism of the young Earth, uh, okay. young, long life model. You, it, you have to ignore 95% of the data. So that answers my other question. That is, <clears throat> because I was thinking <clears throat> if, if um, if the time period in which it's changed is short, like either, you know, a year or two or even 20 years, then right. it would be a challenge to find the piece of wood that fits within that narrow range. But if, right. because of the presence of this data, you'd have to expand out to say 500 years, let's say, right. uh, then it gives you a better chance of finding it a piece does. of wood that's in that. Well, let me tell you what would be a better chance of all of this, <clears throat> except say the flood happened, come on, that flood happened, 30,000 years ago. Then you've got a lot of more time to play with. This becomes feasible, but you're stuck having to have a flood, a worldwide flood. <laughs> Five, what is it, 5,000, 6,000, whatever it is. That is impossible. I mean, no scientist in the historical sciences, uh, I mean, it's just ludicrous. It's just ludicrous. And that's why you are not taken seriously in the scientific community. I, I'm sorry. It's too bad. All, all my friends are in the Adventist community. I wish somebody would take them seriously, but you can't do it. Yeah, oh, good presentation, Herb. Thank you. Um, and uh, this is a, an issue that uh, you know needs to be dealt with. I, I do want to propose possibly that uh, we're looking at too simplistic a situation in terms of the flood. Okay. The flood was a very complex thing. Mm -hmm. Its effects lasted for quite a while afterwards. It mm -hmm. uh, could have been a lot of movement of stored carbon-14 in the stratosphere before that's just a wild idea, but it's, uh, or the uh, magnetic field changed a lot, and cosmic rays mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rays changed a lot, and mm -hmm. so on. So that uh, to to put that much emphasis on the Brown model mm -hmm. uh, is probably unwarranted. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, there's more homework to be done. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all you guys okay. got, as the, far as uh, I know. <laughs> it reminds me of the person who uh, uh, he divorced his wife, uh -huh. uh, and then he married a second wife, and then he divorced his second wife, and uh, so he could marry his first one. <laughs> uh, he needed to do his homework first. <laughs> And uh, among other things, yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, I would say uh, this massive list of carbon coordinates is impressive, but also need to keep in mind uh, a significant portion of it is is uh, floating data that uh, okay. you don't have a really good. Uh, background as to where you put it well uh, and so it's continuous yeah in terms of the mass it's just continuous but so on but uh, uh, well and I appreciate I appreciate the efforts have been done to try and do this uh, the the the, uh, the uh, lake uh, what, what, Sujitsu. Sujitsu. Uh, that's a floating right sequence. Right, yeah. You should be in the lab when they're talking about that site. Uh, <laughs> pieces of wood, they're floating. Right. Yeah, you're uh, right. Except and, uh, you've got, of course, you've got the ice cores. And you can... You've got the ice cores. That's really helpful. Uh, right. uh, we'll, we'll do, let's 
Let's not get into ice cores. That's another bag of can of worms. Well, it depends so, so on I, who you I, are. But uh, in defense of Bob Brown, sure, I'm going to say uh, his uh, amino acid data challenges carbon-14 dating very seriously. Yeah, it's because re re amino acid racemization doesn't work in a lot of cases. Uh, it's not just because it doesn't work. But you have to. For his older dates, you get five, ten thousand, twenty thousand yeah, years. Right. You have to use a different constant. Of course, that's why I mean, nobody uses and, and that, anymore. And or, that, and that, old. but the data's still there. I don't yeah. care. I mean, it's a good thing sure, they don't use it. But you read it's it, still you're, there, you're, and the data right. still demonstrates that there's a challenge to carbon fourteen. Uh, it's there. Yeah. Well, no, oh, oh, I, so, send me a paper. Uh, Send me well, a paper. I'll be well, happy to look at it. Bob's run a paper on that. It's, it's very obvious. I mean, it's, it's really well, striking. Trump, it's striking. Well, so yeah, he, uh, he, he well, did some very good work. When was that, when was that data uh, uh, produced? What, well, what are you talking that, about? The, the data, it's not going to change the dates. I, do. I was shocked. I want to say I, I was shocked. I mean, but what year was that uh, material uh, worked on? Oh, uh, may have, but the carbon fourteen they don't change that much. No, no, I'm talking about the racemization numbers. Uh, that's not going to affect it. What, what, the well, well, you going to change? Must be, you must be referring to a, a paper. Oh I'm man, aware of. I think it's yeah. around, it around the eighties. I think around the eighties. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nineteen eighties. Okay, sure. Uh, and so on. Uh, and well, I, may met, I may not be aware of the paper you're talking about. I'd be happy to look at it. Yeah, well, I handed it to you once before. Uh, uh, you, well, I apologize then. But that, that, I apologize. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I just wanted to point out that it, uh, it isn't as solid as it tends to appear when you say, oh, yeah, look at all these Mm -hmm. dates mm -hmm. that we have here mm -hmm. and so on. You don't want to over... An awful lot of them are, are floating. Some are, some yeah. are. No, that's true. I want to come back to testing this Brown hypothesis. Yes, sir. A uh, first question related to that is, how confident are you or the people that do these measurements right. that the one ring next to another that there's not some spillover or movement of carbon-14. Right. Um, wouldn't you be better to take, uh, you know, five contiguous rings and then wait 20 years and another five contiguous right. rings? No, I, I agree with you, except in, uh, we'd have to make sure we're using the right uh, um, tree type. Uh, but, um, yeah. Different trees have different leakage rates. But if you uh, took conifers, like bristle, bristle cone pine, bristle are very good. That's reason one of the. They were just lucked out. Uh, bristle cones don't have a lot of crosstalk uh, for a variety of physiological reasons. But no, uh, that that was a big, big issue. And back in the again in the Middle Ages when I was in grad school, right. uh, we, we worked on we worked on that a lot, and um, uh, and we could uh, we could use bomb C14. Uh, uh, bomb C14 is recent. Mm -hmm. uh, to yeah, show yeah. how bad adjacent rings are contaminated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. By by crosstalk, by right. By right, right. okay, and uh, that's why it depends on when the heartwood, and in, in the recent stuff, it depends when it goes to heartwood. Once it goes to heartwood, there's no there's no there's no contamination but between rings. Okay. But your point is a very critical point and had to be established in the earlier years. And there's a lot of data in the literature about that, what you need to do and not do uh, to get away from that problem. Okay, the second question I have is you suggested that the Brown hypothesis has never been tested, really. But I guess my question is, <coughs> oh, surely somebody has, has okay. taken a bristlecone pine and, and done this sort of oh, thing. Oh, my God. What I said, what I, I should be more explicit, shouldn't I? What I said was that Yes, you can. It's been tested all over the place in the tree ring data that we use for calibration, yeah. right? And we have tree ring data going back 15,000 years now. I mean, contiguous, contiguous. And then we've got, we've got floaters out there 
much older of mm -hmm. Turing's, okay, but they're not connected in, so we don't know exactly where they are. Um, and then we have other proxies, proxy data. That means um, um, right. Uh, yeah, I'm, oh, sedimentation. Oh, okay, fifteen. But, the fifteen so it's contiguous done all the time. is fine. We don't see the effect you guys need. That's all. But here's the point. Uh, do you trust scientists? Well, it depends on who they are and uh -huh. a lot of other things. Uh -huh. but yeah, sure. See, and the point here is <laughs> you would collect it. A, a young Earth creationist would collect the sample. Okay. Yeah. So that means that a that a uh, somebody else who doesn't agree with your theology isn't going to screw around with the data. All right. It's just a confidence. It's a confidence elevator. No. Yeah, but I guess what you're saying then is that they actually have done the test. Oh yeah, I mean independently, not not doing this, but you can just see that all the data. Yeah, there's no place. See, that's why I'm saying if you would get your flood out to thirty thousand years. Yeah, I don't care where the flood you well, put the flood, but the, but the it makes the, a big difference. The, my question is, do you ever see this this reversal or this increase in carbon fourteen? Not of the magnitude you need. That's the problem. The ma yeah, I can I can tell you situations of where you can change the C14 activity uh, of a piece of wood. I'm sorry, of a series of uh, rings at certain really crazy times when the uh, when we're having a flare. Right. Okay. Right. You can see a huge shift of. I mean, the equivalent would be like I don't know, six seven hundred years within a space of. 30 years. But what you're saying is that that's not nearly enough to... No. You, ca you need this okay. gigantuan number, which you can't get. There's, it doesn't exist in the literature. So your argument, Paul's argument is, you just haven't got the right tree. You have not got the right tree yet. I want to get the right tree and it'll show the effect. Hmm. What well, do you think? I'm. <laughs> You would well, need a sampling of trees. You need more than one tree. <laughs> well, yeah, but he has to, yeah, the trouble is, yeah, well, if, if the, I'll tell you, if, if the GRI would commit a couple of, you know, 30, 50, 60, 70,000 bucks to this, wouldn't be a problem, but they won't. They can't, for various reasons. Oh, I understand, yeah. Good job. Uh, okay. Quickly, um, this is a very naive, question maybe. Um, few years back, a gentleman from Kentucky, Kentucky. Uh, dug out a um, plane that was lost during Second World War, or maybe a squadron of planes. Oh, oh yeah. And um, the ice rings. Right. Oh, yeah. And they have in a That's underground right. somewhere in Colorado, scientific sure, uh, rings. Sure. But you see, uh, very few years. Uh, That's right. The, the, when they dug in uh, and then the ice rings, right. they say, well, the plane has been here for thousands of years. But it's not. Yeah, well, they were at the wrong. Uh, so ice, kindly, ice? Make some, <laughs> kindly make statements on that. So. Um, it's a different situation. Um, the ice cores that they take for chronology and other things right. at the, are at the center of the Greenland ice sheets. At the center, not on the edges. Okay, at the edges, you, you've got this kind of situation. That's why you don't do it. <laughs> you do it in the center <coughs> where you don't have these kind of effects. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that uh, apologists for young, earth cre uh, young life creationists don't criticize it. Uh, the problem is they just don't know what they're talking about. But, but, but who decides that this is the center, so this is where we should get it from? Well, seismic and, uh, and coring cores. There's all kinds of cores into the center of it. You, you can tell on, on the edges. See, it's easy. It's well done. This has been done for 30 years, 40 yeah. years. Just learn. Learn something. Would, learn something good. So, thank you. Sure. I, I would just add that uh, it go, Greenland it goes down for, for nicely. It's very confused at the bottom, right in the center. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the first part? The, the layers, they, they, they go straight down for what, three, four thousand years or so on. But you get down to the bottom where they get these long, it's, it's very confused and it's very compressed. 
And it's yeah. not it's not straight line below, at all. Oh no, below about uh, it depends on where you are, <clears throat> but below about most of it's about one hundred twenty thousand uh, years. It, it does start to get really badly compressed and hard to deal with. That's true. Yeah, I think, it does, I think it does it quite a bit before that. No, I don't I think recall. so. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the, uh, the... I talk to the people who actually do this on, a, on almost uh, a weekly basis, so, yeah. Yeah. The only uh, uh, other comment I would make here is uh, this tree ring, extended tree ring, uh, Bob Brown, <laughs> raising uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, wrote an article on uh, correlation of tree rings, and he gives an example here mm -hmm. in that of a um, Douglas fir in Northwest sample. Okay. That they were able to match to other positions. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're talking uh, about tree, uh, tree, tree rings, fadiness? Yeah, other positions. Right, 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 right. 115. Right. Uh, sorry, 113. Let's not exaggerate. 113 uh, times uh -huh. at the 99.9% .9 confidence level, right. which is better than one chance, less than one chance out of a thousand. Right. And I mean, yeah. and the conclusion? Conclusion is that you can match trees anywhere you want to. No, not true. <laughs> Ferguson himself said. You can't do that. You can, if your statistics is bad and you've picked up the, 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 kind, the wrong kind of tree mm -hmm. in a wrong kind of environment, yes, it, uh, sure. But they know what not, the dendrochronologists know what environments not to pick, what kind of tree species not to use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's pretty well clear. That's why bristlecones mm -hmm. were used. Um, bristlecone turns out to be these very strange. Ferguson himself, yeah. this isn't right. Three percent. Sometimes 3 when he had a thousand rings, he could not match them. Yeah, there's bad points, three percent. Three percent of the time. Three percent of the time. Uh, and it, it varies from where you are along the, uh, the sequence. Uh, so uh, there is a possibility that these various floating things uh -huh. were assembled uh, and assuming that carbon-14 was not evenly distributed, uh -huh. that they don't represent a, a continuous sequence at all. They just represent different localities. So let's, let's uh -huh. pretend for a moment that they're off by, what, 5% each place? Uh, you, but you see, again, using that as an explanation for why um, the data is not coming out as it would help you, you wish it to, doesn't really stand um, empirical observation because you're looking for a huge effect and you don't have that effect. Now, if, again, that's why I'm saying, I mean, it sounds silly. You move the flood back to 30,000 years, a lot of your problems disappear. Now you've got some time to play with, but you can't do that. You're sucked into a model that temp does not have any empirical support. It's so that simple. <laughs> well, it, Sorry to it, be so it does, but that, take, that would take uh, several, uh, several sessions to establish. Well, but, but, if, but, if, but if, here's if, the point, hmm. and th th I think this is the really important point. We're attempting to sidestep that whole problem of matching trees by simply taking it on one tree. Exactly. Perfect. That's, ex that's genius, pure genius. I agree with you. You've got to get around that problem that you're addressing, Ariel. All right? But I still say you're locked into an impossible task. But I'm willing to go down that road just to see what happens. And let's just pretend, for purposes of discussion, you find a log that has some of these effects. Glory hallelujah. I'd be famous in the radiocarbon field. I'd be rich and famous. <laughs> Of course, my colleagues would think I've gone a little cooey, but, um, and then we do it again and again and again and get the same result. Oh, wow, wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't send, that be Send it to a different laboratory, get another Oh, we, we'd send it five labs, make sure nobody's screwing around. Now, I'll tell you where you can get a sample like that, however, but you're not gonna be able to. I won't let you, because it's fraudulent. Go to Iceland. 
go to places in Iceland where they've got the volcanoes pumping out stuff. Okay, that's why I have st stipulations here. You can't go to environments that are known to produce anomalies. You can't go to I Pickett Iceland. I don't think you'd find anyway. Because presumably the Iceland belches out uh, huge amounts of dead carbon, CO2, carbon dioxide without yeah. significant amounts of carbon right. 14. And, and no fair, no fair getting it from the middle of. Uh, of um, where's the huge amounts of volcan volcanism oh, around here? Okay, you, you you walk right into my model here. Sure. Thank, thank you. Good. The flood was a complex thing. All right. There could have been a lot of different things going on. I, I hope you're right. And you just grab a bunch of, of floating a floating chronology and stack them together. Sure. Uh, you really confuse the truth. Okay, then it sure doesn't show up very well. So I go for amino acid racialization. It doesn't work. Well, wait a minute. Do it on shell. It works on shell. Do it on shell. On shell, it'll work. If you, can, if you get shell and C14 dates, and somebody knows what they're doing with amino acid racialization, oh, we can get, they can get beautiful um, inferred numbers off of shell. Marine shell, sorry. Marine shell, marine shell. Not, not ostrich egg. And ostrich egg. Okay, because there is some ostrich. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Oh. You get beautiful dates. Oh well, man, uh, you, you don't get correct dates out of the ocean. What you say, marine shells? Yeah. Yeah. What about the reservoir effect? Uh, this is amino acid racemization. It doesn't have a reservoir oh, effect. About, I, mean, I was talking about carbon fourteen. No, uh, we uh, know uh, the carbon fourteen will give the right answer. Oh. It, it won't get the right answer <laughs> where it's upwelling, right? <laughs> That's Sorry. one of the things you have to watch out for. Uh, yeah, well, we know the C14 will give you the right answer. Um, always does, 100% of the time. Remember, God gave us radiocarbon dating. <laughs> <laughs> Are we done? Thank you so much. I appreciate okay. it.